Now, at this time, we'll take questions from the audience. Um, my name is Matthew Meek, uh, I'm a teacher here at the college. I'd just like to know, um, in the time that uh, Williams was uh, um, with the, the group of uh, intellectuals, uh, the boys and others that you mentioned, and the formation of the uh, uh, Pan African uh, Congress, which uh, ultimately took place in the uh, early 70s, did he have any fundamental disagreements with uh, Du Bois and others with respect to uh, uh, his view of uh, Pan-Africanism? And uh, because you mentioned earlier that um, he saw nothing of Mother Africa preceding, uh, for example, Mother Trinidad and, and Tobago. So uh, was there fundamental differences uh, with their views of uh, Pan-Africanism in his view? Uh, could you uh, tell us what they were? I wasn't suggesting that William was part of the group. The point I was making was that all of this was going on as he was a student of African civilization. Um, I am not aware in that period, even when he came to Howard or in, in his work with Atlanta, um, that where Dr. Du Bois had begun the Atlanta series, and even the work that Du Bois had begun at Harvard, with the Harvard Historical Series of the New York so I am not aware that in any of, of these instances that we had any fundamental disagreements with them. The other thing I think is also very important to understand in that period, I remember once the LIJ was talking to me about his relationship with George Patmore. James had spent a lifetime attacking Stalinism, and Patmore for a period of time was the representative of the Stalinist movement as far as the African struggle was concerned. And it was really as a response to his break with Stalinism that he wrote the book Pan-Africanism -African, Pan and Communism. But James would say to us that they were there in London, and even though one was going in one direction ideologically and the other was going in another direction, that they never fought or had any battles among themselves. Because if it is one thing they were all united on, was the emancipation of the African. So I am not aware of all of any sort of division. And as late as 1960, James had a very close relationship with CLI and with Eric William. And up to his death, I know that he spoke very highly of the contribution he had made with the Adidas and all that publicly. But I am not aware of any kind of division. But specifically, the reference, that reference that, you, that I quoted about Mother India and Mother Africa arose out of the circumstances of the Trinidad and Tobago society and the need for, it, for unifying that society as part of the larger Caribbean society. I think he was speaking to the issues of the region. And therefore, it was in that context. I mean, I myself, this is why I referred to you, but had no knowledge of any particular conflict that he may have had with uh, uh, Dr. Du Bois. Yeah, we all know that um, physical slavery was abolished in 1834. But you alluded, my name is Dudley, Dudley McIntyre, you alluded to the fact that we are still enslaved. What do you mean by that? Are you talking about the mental slavery that affects our people? And what could we do to get out of this, to er eradicate? Well, I mean, if you look at um, the special convention speech that well, Pat Moore referred to just now, um, just after the Black Power Report and so on, Dr. Williams describes very um, clearly and, um, the economic and social conditions that have still existed in Trinidad and Tobago. If you look at, for instance, um, in the section on the future of the Caribbean and from Columbus to Castro, he goes into great detail in, in, in that again that the economic resources of the society continue to be governed and known and exploited from abroad, that the ideas, the cultural ideas, the intellectual ideas that dominate the society were ideas that were still being imported from abroad. One only has to sit in Trinidad today and look at the television to understand what, what we mean by slavery today. I mean, you, you almost have more knowledge of the weather in the United States looking at Trinidad and today go television than the weather in Trinidad. You get CNN from the time you get up to the time you go to sleep. And the phrase that he used first in the Negro and the Caribbean to a great extent applies today. We eat what we do not produce and we produce what we do not eat. But then you see, this is part and parcel of the reality that is overwhelming the world. You, 
you would sit down in London or you sit down in, in Asia, you would watch CNN as well. In fact, it's, it's been raising a tremendous debate in it's been raising a tremendous debate in India in the context of introducing multimedia in India, and Indian society is up in arms against it. The globalization process and the effect of this multinational, multilateral financial institutions, it's this whole trend towards weakening the capacity of governments to respond to problems within their borders is the real problem that we, are, that we, we all are being faced with. It is manifesting itself in some curious ways as well anyhow, because as, as, as more and more uh, we, um, these societies are impoverished, you notice there's legal and illegal immigration to the places where the wealth is going. So if the choices will have to be made and how they choose to make it. It might be Haiti and Cuba today, it is North Africa into Europe today, it is the Turks into, into Germany today. The fear of the Slavs going into Europe, which is why the Germans pumped so much money into trying to, re to rehabilitate the former Soviet economy. But this is going to be one of the inevitable consequences of the kind of development that is taking place. The question, the, the answer... Um, the, the, how do you kill yeah, I, I agree with what Mr. Crypto was saying. And we, we are com bombarded with the American culture. So he didn't address the last part of my question. What are we to do to get rid of that? Well, what type of educational process should we introduce in the country? I think what is very clear, I mean, if we look at the period, say, from the end of the war to the last 10 or 15 years, the so-called anti-colonial period, the so-called nationalist period, um, what was very clear is that we had operated under the conception that if we were going to develop in these societies, what we will have to do is to encourage foreign investment. It was almost like the, 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 the rule of thumb all over. In Ghana, Dr. Nkrumah felt that it was not going to be a problem. All we have to do is to, as he says, give you the political kingdom and everything else will be added on to it. Mr. Nehru in, in India felt the same way, that once we had political control, everything was going to be okay. We who live long after them know that everything has not been okay because what has happened is, as, as again, as the other speaker suggested, this sort of globalization of the economy has meant not just the globalization of the economy, but just globalization is okay, but the global monopolization of the world economy. You look at, at, at the major resources in the world today, whether you're looking at bauxite, you're looking at oil, you're looking at sugar, whatever the specific commodity, you have one or two or three cooperations that dominate, regulate, control, and distribute these resources. And they distribute these resources under their conditions. Now, one of the unfortunate things I think about the whole situation with us in the Caribbean, and one day we're going to have to address it. We're going to have to attempt to make ourselves better aware of what has gone on in Cuba. Because the Cuban experience is the only experience anywhere in the third world where the quality of life of the population after the removal of foreign domination had become fundamentally and structurally better. Whatever we might take of the ideological direction of the Cuban revolution, the fact is that the Cuban people have been able to produce for quite some time most of the basic and technical and social resources required for building a new society. They have been the only people who have done something else, have begun to feel the need to fundamentally and structurally reorder the institution of colonial administration. And that is an issue that has continued to be debated even right here in the United States. I remember a few years ago, um, um, Robert Allen in his book, Black Awakening in Capitalist America, in attempting to integrate the nationalist movement here or the anti-colonial movement as he calls it here in the United States within the context of the larger world colonial movement um, and had some very obvious theoretical problems because of the fact that you were struggling with an oppressor within your own society as against we in the Caribbean and in Africa where the oppressor was quote unquote outside of the society and it is out of that attempt to, to, to de redefine the struggle here within the larger global anti-colonial movement that they developed the concept of internal colonialism. 
And as Robert Allen tells us in the book, he said one of the things that we in the United States have come to realize that there is in the past we have attempted to associate colonialism with foreign domination and foreign control. What we have to begin to understand that that foreignness of the colonial experience is just the state upon which imperialism has exploited and oppressed our people. It is the institutions of colonial domination that have to be changed. And I think that today we have to address those questions in the Caribbean. How we address, and I, I suggested it this morning when I asked the question, for instance, of the content of the educational system as one example. I'm sorry to be that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The question is directed to Mr. Padmo. As a former uh, cabinet minister and now political analyst, what in your opinion, Mr. Padmo, that profound leadership of Dr. William, Dr. William Bowden, 25 years that you have referred to, the change of government have only taken place one time. The form of government, the form of government that we are now in the possession of, which is the, the Republican form of government, what in your opinion is the major benefit that the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago has benefited from that form of government? On the Republican form? On the Republican form of government. Right. I mean, what we are saying to the world is that this independent country would choose to derive its leader from among itself, not from outside. When we became independent in 62, we were still a monarchical state. Our head of state was the queen. So that what now our head of state is the president. So what we are actually benefiting from the Republican government is removing is removing a governor general and replacing a president. Well, in, 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 in a formal sense, yes. Well, I suppose I'm out of line because I'm not going to ask a question, but it was interesting what Mr. McIntyre said about what we can do to eradicate this tendency we have in the Caribbean and in Trinidad and Tobago, since we're talking about that, to import our culture, foods, etc., fashion, lifestyle. Um, I think that under the PNM administration, we had made some strides early on with the imposition of the negative list, the bi-local jamboree that uh, fizzled out, that was going strong for several years, and not to uh, not to forget the steel bar movement, the 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 way that it has developed now. I'm sure you must, most people here will remember what the steel band movement, if such it could be called, uh, was like in prior, 19, prior to 1956. And also you cannot forget the Best Village program. Successive governments have seen fit to remove this program, but while it was in its heyday, you cannot deny the importance of uh, what that program did to the culture of Trinidad and Tobago, to our food. The kinds of foods that we eat now, we had a wonderful lunch today, those were not the kinds of foods that you would serve at a, an elegant dinner party prior to the Best Village uh, program beginning. The culture, the abundance of talent that we see in Canada and Tobago today all flourished as a direct result of the PNM administration's Best Village program. So that should not be forgotten. Unfortunately, these things have died out now for one reason or another. So I don't know exactly what you, what uh, one could do now to, to say how you could uh, try to build them back up again, I suppose one could try. But basically, I think the PNM administra administration at the time did do something to try to uh, get our people to appreciate our culture and our own sense, personal sense of identity, which we don't see anymore then. For those of you who joined us late, that is Ms. Erica Williams, daughter of the late Dr. Eric Williams. Okay, I got a question here from Mr. Ian Smith for Dr. Turner. Well, his question is, can he differentiate between the present PNM philosophy versus that of Dr. Eric Williams? <laughs> I, 
I didn't know the president of the American philosophy. <laughs> Where well, you can address on whatever little you know. But to be very serious, no, that comment is also very serious. <laughs> the first time that, and I always like to remind people that I am not a member of the PNL, even though I always sound like defend, having to defend the PNL. And I don't know if they feel bad, but I, I just want to be clear so that um, nobody thinks. Um, <laughs> The first time I had some problems with this situation that has come to be described by the present Prime Minister, the old PNM and the new PNM, was, I think right here in this hall, in 1987 or 88, he was on a visit to New York and he came to address the Trinidad people here in New York. And he brought with him a secret program for reorganizing the PNL. Nobody ever saw the program because they never opened it to discuss it. And somebody, a number of people in the audience, and it's very important to hear this, a number of people in the audience began to attack the PNL. The PNL, teeth for a lot of money, is the teeth, a lot of money. The PNL is the PNL, like the PNL is the other. Now, when Mr. Manning got up to retire, he said, well, now that I'm in the other party and so on, these things are not going to happen. And I just almost collapsed. <laughs> because I couldn't believe somebody who was the head of a party could stand up there and do that kind of thing and not even make an attempt to deal with it. So I got up and I said to him, Mr. Manning, why don't you decide to form your own party? Because if you were going to head a party that you can't defend, you don't need to do, be in this party at all. And to add insult to injury, they leave my body by the same time. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm not, this is not anything to be humorous about. I'm very serious. Mm -hmm. And on several occasions since, the PNM today in no way represents the aspirations and goals and the kinds of things that the PNM I knew when I was growing up and I made such a this is not any mudsling of Mr. Manning. This is very serious discussion of the point. Say the time has come to speak of many things. And we, if we are going to correct the situation of Trinidad Tobago, we have the honest and forthright. The PLM today represents not even a shadow of what the party came to be in the life and history of the people of the Caribbean. And not just the Caribbean. I remember when, the, and again, this is another reason why it's important to understand the role of the PLM beyond the, 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 the obvious things. Because it was through the PNM I got to meet C.R.R. James. And I remember when the Federation was in problem with a lot of us young people, because I was in high school still, and they, Dr. Incoma wrote, Dr. Williams, and, so, and James at that time was General Secretary of the West Indian Federal Labour Party, and said the work that you all are doing in the Caribbean is of invaluable importance to the liberation movement in Africa, and do what you could to see that that Federation don't break up. The nation was must rebuild all over the third world. The battle for Frank Warren to become the captain of the West Indies, particularly the black man, was fought for in the nation. If it was not for the nation, the world would not know when George Padmore, the father of Pan-Africanism, died. And a whole lot of other things. The whole struggle for Indian independence took place, the history of that in the nation. Today, you don't even have a nation as a paper or otherwise. <laughs> because of the Thank you. But if I, if I, if I may make one observation, it, it tells you about, it is interesting that this kind of discussion is taking place right here. And it is telling you about the kind of role that institutions like this one need to play. This, if we continue to believe that we will be a free or unfree society because of the leader, then you know you are going to consign yourself to being unfree for the rest of your lives. What has to be done is to, to spread among as many people, especially the leadership category, uh, categories in all societies, a view of themselves and their societies and their place in the world if you are going to prevail against what is happening the man after whom this place has been named. Mm -hmm. 
was part of a movement in the 60s that today is seeing a lot of those gains being eroded. You don't win and then you stand pat and say I've won forever. You have to be re-examining the circumstances in which you live and refighting those struggles over. They come in different forms. And this, the, you know, the power, the power center that you are up against is always rethinking its position. And if we feel that we can make an achievement and then go to sleep, we will be talking like this generation after generation, even if 50 years hence capitalism and slavery is reissued again. This question is directed to the panel. My name is Carlton Haywood of Atlanta. We came out of a period of nationalistic identity where there were some core values around which the people were energized and moved forward. We have transitioned, and I'm wondering whether the panel can identify some core values around which we are now moving. And what is it, in your view, that has caused the either Trinidad worldview or the Caribbean worldview to fall away so that we have the young people wondering at this time from some, for some sort of direction. If you were to reflect on it, you would see that it is a kind of a uncertainty that is affecting the world. You know, for example, within recent times, you were seeing in a lot of United States, UK, all the places, they talk about leadership, who are the leaders of the world today? I mean, in, Given the period of rapid change that we are going through, everything is almost in a state of flux. And how you establish, you know, there are no stability points now, and I think we would need some time for a settling down before we can begin to sort of move forward again. I mean, I, I, I really don't know how else to say. When, for example, we spoke a while ago about an earlier approach to development based on foreign exchange. I mean, I made reference in this to the iron and steel complex in Trinidad and Tobago, which if, if there was any serious effort on the part of all of those who talked about development and economic growth, etc., that program for Trinidad and Tobago, using Trinidad and Tobago resources to develop a Trinidad and Tobago industrial capability to export and maximize the returns out of it should have been encouraged. But the minute it got off the ground, all of the forces came to be into being to prevent it succeeding. And what you are having now with under all of these programs of structural adjustment, the very things you, um, they make impossible for you to give industrialists in your country, they don't mind you giving to foreign industrialists who can then come back and export to the United States without any um, artificial restraints, voluntary restraints put in their way. The whole system is designed to remove your capacity to develop your country. And that is the problem. If, if, you, if, you, if you build the thing, you don't have the market. And if you don't have the market, what are you going to do? My name is Joaquin Marco from Grenada. The last year I went to Trinidad, I don't know Trinidad, so I just went around, walking around the place. And when I asked, certain names in Trinidad. It seems that the large section of the population know very little of these people, including Dr. Eric Williams. It seems to me that a certain age group of Trinidadians um, know very little, if they know anything of them at all. And then the age group that knows him, they find people there are very vague on their knowledge and Dr. Eric Williams, and perhaps it is reflected in the attendance of today. The question is, then what are the people of Trinidad doing so that 10, 15, 20 years from now, names like Eric Williams and C.L.R. James would be still alive? No, the gentleman said he was making an observation, but I mean, you know, what is... Well, you know, you see, the fact of the matter is, um, he just visited Trinidad and he found from asking questions that few people knew Dr. Williams. Um, it's a little mind-boggling. You know, it's, you know, it's, 
I really don't know the terms on which I, uh, on which I should answer that because I know that in the schools, they still teach about great Trinidadians and among the people who would be included in this would be Dr. Williams. So that I am a little puzzled I mean, to, to, as to how I can answer that question on his terms. No, they don't believe. Sorry? No, they don't believe. That I don't believe? You don't believe what he said. No, but it's not a question of not believing what he said. It is a question of conceptualizing the thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like you all to join me in a round of applause for Mr. Patrick and Mr. Patrick. Next, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Sharon Gopal McNichol, Dr. Elizabeth Nunes, Dr. Vanis James to the podium, please. 